Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for being here with us today to chat about the future of climate-related disclosure regulation in the EU with some advice for U.S.-based companies trying to navigate their obligations for their EU operations as well. My name is Constance Stoop. I'm the Director of Sustainability at Sustain Light, and I am joined today by Joanne O'Donnell, who is the head of the Global Regulatory Compliance Team at Compliance and Risks, and Austin Kennedy, who is the Manager of Sustainability Reporting and ESG Performance for Philip Morris International. Welcome, Joanne and Austin. We're so happy to have you with us. Thank you. Delighted to be here. Just a few words on housekeeping before we get started. Please feel free to post questions via the Q&A feature at any time. We'll try to answer as many as possible, either in the chat or live at the end. And if we can't get to your questions, we will follow up after the event. And also, we will send a link to the recording of this presentation in the coming days. We have a lot of ground to cover today. Uh, including an overview of CSRD, followed by what's most important to know for reporters, the ESRS, including climate transition plans, and then we'll wrap it up with a spotlight on international regulations and some insight on what lies ahead. And with that, I'll hand it off to our expert, Joanne, to get us started. Thank you. Thank you, Constance. Um, so my aim today is basically to give you an overview of the main climate disclosure regs currently in force in the EU with the, with a specific focus on the um, Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, as, as Constant mentioned. Um, there's lots of information out there on the CSRD, which can be really, really overwhelming. So my aim really is to simplify as much as possible um, and to help you understand where the CSRD fits in. Um, with some of the other EU level disclosure requirements relating to climate. Um, and I'm also going to do a bit of a deep dive into some of the EU member state regs in this space as well. I'll also touch upon some of the climate dis uh, disclosures outside of the EU with a specific focus on the US and the UK. And then we can kind of look ahead and see uh, what's coming down the track for, for 2023. So I wanted to kind of kick off with, um, with a look at this regulatory growth chart on ESG reporting. So this is taken from C2P, which is our um, uh, database at compliance and risks. And it covers ESG reporting regulations, both proposed and in force, uh, essentially for the past um, seven years, since 2016. So the reason why I chose to start with this visual is that it gives you a really, really striking um, representation of the, the rate of regulatory activity in this field, particularly in the past two to three years. As you can see, there has been an incredible proliferation of, of climate and ESG reporting regs, um, particularly since 2022. Um, and the EU has really been leading the way um, in this area. So I think it's interesting to explore the reasons why there has been such a sudden increase in climate disclosure regs, particularly in the past two to three years. Um, and you have a lot of sustainability concerns for product manufacturers um, that have been increasing at an alarming rate. And these are largely driven by, you know, tightening regulations, pressure from investors, pressure for consumers. And this is really driving companies to try to reduce the burden of their activities and their products on the planet. So they're really looking at, at how their products are designed, engineered, and they're looking at ways to, to meet their performance and quality requirements while using fewer, fewer resources. So regulators are really responding to these concerns. Um, and the knock-on consequences is there has been a huge increase in regulation for product manufacturers to contend with. So this increased regulatory pressure um, is also, uh, you know, it's driven by and it's linked to a shift in consumer behavior and investment behavior. So this means that the companies are really um, under immense pressure to incorporate ESG and climate disclosures into their into their strategies. So I suppose now that we're getting into the meat of, of, of today's uh, presentation, the, the EU sustainability reporting framework Work is really kind of comprised of three main pillars. So I'll leave the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive until the last, because that's, you know, what the focus of this presentation. But I wanted to give you a kind of an overview of how the other two regulations also slot in with the Sustainability Reporting Directive as well. So you have the uh, Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation, and then you have the Taxonomy Regulation. So 
the uh, Sustainability Finance Disclosure Regulation that contains sustainability assessment and disclosure obligations applicable to financial products and financial entities. And it essentially sets out the information that investors must collect from their investee companies. So again, the aim of the SFDR is to avoid greenwashing by financial products. So if you are a US or non-EU firm, you would be impacted by the SFDR if you have EU subsidiaries or you offer products or financial services in the EU. Um, then you also have the, the, uh, the EU taxonomy, which sits in between the, the SFDR and the CS um, or D, and that establishes a, a classification system um, for um, for both regimes. So basically it provides uh, companies and investors with definitions for which economic activities can be considered environmentally um, sustainable. So that is also designed to protect investors against greenwashing. Um, the disclosures under the EU taxonomy are mandatory for large companies only, but smaller companies can choose to disclose the taxonomy alignment of their products also. So as you can see, the EU taxonomy sits nicely in between the SFDR and the um the CS or D. So I guess to 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 chat about the the CS or D in particular, which is the focus of today's presentation, um, we need to kind of go back a few years to the non-financial reporting directive. Um, no discussion of the CS or D is really complete without first looking at the NF or D, because the CS or D has effectively expanded on and revised the um the non-financial reporting directive. So that directive has um been a for since 2014, and it applies to public interest entities with more than 500 employees. And those entities have essentially been required to report on certain non-financial matters, including environmental matters, social matters, treatment of employees, respect for human rights, anti-corruption and bribery, and diversity on company boards. Um, the problem with the NF4D uh, is and was that it had, um, it had several deficiencies. The main one being that companies were essentially given free reign to choose whatever reporting framework they, they wanted to use. So there was a real alphabet soup of, of differing standards. They could choose from uh, the GRI, the SASB, the UNGC, or the TCFD. So this lack of standardization really resulted in stakeholders not having a reliable or trustworthy overview of the company as certain information was not being reported um, consistently. Um, stakeholders were really struggling to compare companies due to the inconsistent reporting requirements. Um, there was a real lack of credibility and there was an increase in reporting costs for companies because companies were essentially reporting against conflicting and often multiple um, reporting standards. So because of this um, alphabet soup of, of, uh, of, of reporting um, uh, formats, the EU launched a consultation um, in February 2020 um, in order to revise and revamp the NF4D. And um, the results of this um, essentially were the, the CSRD, which entered into force in January. But it is worth noting that the, the NF4D will remain in force until the companies have to apply the rules of the CSRD. So um, the CSRD entered into force 5th of January 2023, and as I mentioned earlier, it is the third pillar of the sustainability framework here in the EU. It ensures that investors have access to the information they need to assess investment risks arising from climate change and other sustainability issues. And it's all about transparency. It creates a real culture of transparency about the impacts of companies on people and the environment, and similarly, the impacts of people on the, and the environment on, on the company also. So I guess we'll kick on in terms of who is impacted. So from the outset, it, it's important to note that the CSRD is much broader in scope. So its predecessor, the NFRD, covered about, there was about 11,700 companies that fell into scope whereas the CSRD is much broader, and that brought about 50,000 companies in scope. So it applies to large public interest entities um, with more than 500 employees that were already subject to the NF4D. It also applies to large companies that meet two out of the following three um, thresholds. So more than 250 employees, they have a balance sheet in excess of 20 million euros and or a net turnover in excess of 40 million euros. 
It also applies to EU listed SMEs, um, except micro undertakings. So micro undertakings are defined as companies that meet two out of the following three. They have less than 10 employees. They have a turnover at less than 0.7 million and they have total assets of less than 0.35 million. And the final group of companies that fall in scope are non-EU companies with a net turnover in excess of 150 million and that have a subsidiary in the EU that follow the criteria applicable to the EU companies um, or have a branch in the EU that generate in excess of 40 million. So essentially, if you are a US or another um, non-EU parent company, you would be subject to the CSR or D if you fall into those um, criteria. A couple of other things important to note here as well for, for US companies. Um, if you're a non-EU parent company, so if you're a US parent company that falls in scope of the CSRD, um, the reporting would cover the entire group. So that's from the perspective of the parent. Um, there will be a modified set of disclosure standards that will apply to non-EU groups. Those standards are expected to mainly focus on disclosures relating to companies' impacts on people and the, on the environment rather than sustainability risks facing the companies. But the drafts um, for these uh, disclosure standards for the non-EU groups have not yet been published um, yet. And the EU also contains, the, the, the CSRD also contains certain transitional measures to, to kind of ease the burden um, to phase in the requirement for these non-EU groups. So essentially until January 2030, if a non-EU group has an EU subsidiary that is large or an EU listed company and thus independently in scope of the CSRD, that non-EU group may provide a consolidated report that covers only the EU subsidiaries rather than the consolidated global group. So there are a few um, additional uh, transitional measures there for those companies. Joanne, if I could jump in here with just a quick question. Sure. Um, what, right. about, uh, what about companies that fall outside of the scope of CSRD, such as unlisted yeah. SMEs? Will they have any disclosure requirements at all? Um, yeah, well, the, um, the European Financial Reporting Advisory Group, um, who are responsible for drafting the, um, the European Sustainability Reporting Standards under the CSRD, they, um, they set up a working group in January on a potential standard for unlisted SMEs. So we know that the that listed SMEs are in scope, but there are a lot of unlisted um, small and medium sized enterprises that would fall outside of scope. So the um, so FRAG have um, they're, they're, they're reviewing and deliberating on a potential voluntary standard that would apply to those um, unlisted SMEs. Um, there is a, an issues paper that was released by FRAG in January, um, which contains a, a pre-publication draft of that voluntary standard. So it's not an official draft, it's, it's what's called a pre-publication draft. Um, and that contains about 48 disclosure requirements um, that may apply um, on a voluntary basis to these um, voluntary SMEs. So that's definitely a development um, that's worth keeping an eye on in 2023, because it's quite possible that this, uh, a, that the official draft of this standard will be released um, later in the year. Great to know. Thank you. No problem. Um, okay. So uh, move on here. So the the timelines. Um, so I guess the you know the time the deadlines are looming, and um, you know there are um, from January twenty twenty four the first set of companies are going to fall in scope of the CSRD. So I guess the directive entered into force January twenty twenty three. Um, in June of this year, we're going to see the the actual standards mandated by the directive are due to be finalized. Um, they're currently with the EU Commission. And January 2024 is when large EU public interest companies already subject to the NF4D will need to start preparing for their reporting obligations. So those reports are due to be published in 2025, but companies um, that fall within this first wave will need to start um, preparing for the reports in January 2024. Then from January 2025, you have the next wave of companies. Um, and they will be the large EU undertakings not currently subject to the NF4D. 
So they will have to start preparing for their reporting obligations then. That report or those reports will be published in 2026. Similarly, January 2026, you'll have the listed SMEs and other undertakings who will need to start preparing for their reports, which will be published in uh, 2027. There is an opt out possible under certain conditions until 2028 for this group of people of, of companies. And then in January 2028, you will have the non EU undertakings um, with significant EU under um, EU turnover. Those reports will be due in, in 2029. So as I mentioned, those deadlines are looming um, and um, the, the deadlines for the implementation by member states will be June 2024. Also, that's worth noting. Speaking of implementation, I have a question here for Austin. Um, you are a large uh, accelerated filer. What is your plan for complying in accordance with this timeline? And then also, could you offer some advice for listed SMEs that will be subject to reporting in 2027, but haven't yet launched any types of reporting activities? Yeah, yeah, of course. So, I mean, I guess first off, as Joan said, a really great job on uh, explaining these standards are going to be impacting, you know, different companies in different ways across different time horizons. I think the first step is really to just, it's really important for companies to understand their potential exposure and then really determine what the implications may be for them. So for Philip Morris International, I'm just going to use a shorthand TMI through, we're a large publicly listed U.S. headquartered multinational company, and we're a parent company for various affiliates and subsidiaries based in the EU that fall into different kind of categories on its timeline. So for us specifically, certain subsidiaries in Europe will be included in the first wave uh, and others in the second wave of applicability. And then as the non-EU headquartered company, we're going to be responsible to report on this fiscal year 28 data and fiscal year 29 as is kind of shown in this timeline here in a consolidated manner. Uh, those standards aren't available yet, so there are some questions there for us. Uh, there are also some open questions on what standards, if any, will be considered equivalent for non-EU headquarters parent companies. Um, so that's part of the legislation, but it hasn't actually been, been clarified. So for example, if the ISSB is considered an equivalent international standard, we may be able to report against that in lieu of the ESRS on a consolidated group basis. So that would potentially uh, help quite a bit with reporting burden, interoperability, various standards. Um, so for us, you know, in our situation, in our circumstances, we've already taken a pretty robust sustainability materiality assessment that we'll discuss that a little bit later on. Um, and historically, we have aligned our disclosures with the GRI and the SASB where appropriate, kind of based on the results of this assessment. And those are really the building blocks of a lot of the variety of, of proposals that are out currently. Um, so the next step for us really will be to undertake kind of a more detailed gap analysis. You know, we have to adjust the current metric definitions to ensure kind of more precise alignment with the ESRS language and concepts. Um, and we're also going to have to think about ways to kind of more di easily disaggregate data by country. Uh, so as Jan was explaining, um, we as a parent company could simplify the process a lot for affiliates and subsidiaries in Europe by producing an EU block uh, disclosure in one of our five largest subsidiaries in Europe. Um, but to be able to do that, you have to be able to disaggregate a lot of data that we currently centralize into this country by country, uh, country by country level. We also have to think a lot about kind of the external assurance of our uh, So we currently obtain external assurance for kind of certain environmental and health and safety metrics and emissions metrics, uh, as well as some of our kind of business transformation metrics that are, that are showing our progress on our smoke-free journey but not to the full set of indicators we report or the full set of indicators that would fall onto CSR. And so, you know, for SMEs, I think the first step is really going to be to understand the exposure and associated timelines. Um, I'd imagine for a lot of SMEs, it'll be much more straightforward to size than it is for us as a large multinational. Um, then I, I would imagine they would want to, you know, follow a similar process. They'll want to perform a gap analysis on the technical side of things. Now, whether or not they've already begun reporting against voluntary standards, they can they should consider starting that um, as a test run. Um, and then finally, I'd also say that really this uh, this space has exploded lately. So you know, traditional large advisory and consulting firms and then smaller and emerging outfits are, are fairly well prepared and positioned uh, positioned to help companies in this area. So I, I, you know, SMEs shouldn't be afraid to seek external counsel and advice in the next couple of years to really prepare as we head into. The 
2026, 2027 for them. Yeah, it's great advice. Yeah, great, great. Agree. Yes. Great advice, Austin. Looks like there are lots of tools and resources out there. And uh, I'll hand it back to you, Joanne. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Austin. Um, so I suppose we just want to um, review what companies must disclose. So disclosures under the CSRD cover a wide range of ESG related topics. Um, uh, obviously environmental, so they would cover the EU taxonomy environmental objectives, which are climate change mitigation, climate change adaptation, water and marine resources, biodiversity, resource use and circular economy. And then you have the social aspect, which would include, uh, you know, human rights, diversity and inclusion, health and safety, and then governance. Um, so, you know, what policies, um, internal controls, um, do, do, does the company have ownership, structural transparency, ethics, anti-corruption, etc. Um, and all of these are obviously subject to the double materiality concept, which we'll discuss um, uh, shortly also. So, you know, a wide range of disclosures. Um, that that um, that needs to be uh, implemented by by companies. Right, and just a quick question here before we move on. Um, this is something we hear quite a bit, but uh, companies, especially SMEs, tend to be concerned about having to disclose commercially sensitive information. Um, how does CSRD account for it? Is there an option to omit certain information that companies deem confidential? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I know this is an area actually that several regulators have addressed recently. So um, I know in the EU, um, this was raised during the, the consultation process um, by the European Financial Reporting Advisory Group on the draft standards. So uh, one of the draft standards, I think it's the general requirements um, standard that includes an option to omit certain pieces of information if that information relates to intellectual property or know-how or you know the results of innovation. I think there are certain conditions attached to that exemption, but the exemption does, does exist. And I think that the ISSB last month also approved a similar type exemption to be included in its um, sustainability standard also. So it's definitely something that, that uh, companies are concerned about and that the regulators are taking into consideration. Right, that's reassuring and also familiar from a lot of the voluntary standards. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in terms then of other um, disclosures, so again, we mentioned all of the NF4D disclosures, um, then these are the, the key kind of concepts that need to be taken into consideration when you are preparing your disclosures. So obviously there's a lot of uh, talk about uh, double materiality. Um, you know, companies need to take into account the sustainability risks, including the climate change risks affecting the company. So that's kind of from the outside in, but also how the company impacts society and the environment. So from the inside out. Um, business model and strategy, um, including, you know, opportunities um, and resilience to sustainability risks is also another important um, factor. Climate transition plans. There's a lot of um, uh, talk as well about climate transition plans, which companies um, should prepare to ensure compatibility with the transition to a sustainability, to a sustainable economy. Um, the CSRD mentions specifically the 1.5 degree global warming under the Paris Climate Change Agreement, as well as the European climate law also. So they are specifically referenced um, in that agreement also. So companies must share their transition plans and demonstrate compatibility with these goals. Um, Time-bounded targets, also really, really important that there are specific targets for these, um, for these goals, for these plans. And um, sustainability due diligence process, as you all know, there is a draft corporate sustainability due diligence directive also making its way through the EU at the moment. Um, and companies will be required to disclose the, the due diligence processes that they have implemented with regards to sustainability matters. Um, so that's really, really important too. Um, and also information about, you know, a company's own operations, value chain, business relationships, etc. So um, all of those are really, really important. But the climate uh, transition plans in particular, that's definitely one to watch for this year because there's a lot of, um, a lot of discussion around those at the moment.
I am going to jump in again. Uh, I actually have a couple of questions for both of you on these topics. Um, first, Joanne, you mentioned the climate transition plans. What yeah. if a company does not yet have one? Yeah, so the the climate change, um, the draft climate change um, standard under the um, CSRD, it, it doesn't actually contain a substantive obligation to produce a transition plan. What it states is that companies should disclose any plans that they may have to align their, you know, their their business model and strategy with those key climate goals that I mentioned there under the Paris Agreement and the European Climate Law. So essentially, if you do not have a transition or a climate transition plan currently in place, what you will need to do is just indicate whether and if so, when you are planning to adopt the transition plan. So um, there's no need to panic on that front just yet. Right. That was my question for Austin, if it's something that a company should be concerned about, but um, it sounds like not so much. So what does it take to put a climate transition plan into place? Yes, I mean, I think the theme of sort of my initial remarks still largely apply in that it, it really depends a lot on individual companies and their level of maturity in these areas and kind of the extent to which they already report against some of these existing voluntary standards and frameworks, right? Uh, so, for example, with the, the CEB climate questionnaire is already aligned with and integrated much of the type of disclosure required, right? So companies, including SMEs that are already responding to CDP with climate with a high degree of transparency are kind of already off to a good start. Um, and then I think, again, for other companies, there's just, there's really a wealth of experience in the consulting arena at this point to help with their specific circumstances. So I'd really encourage companies to, to reach out sooner rather than later, especially as we get closer to 2026, more and more SMEs are gonna be here reaching out. Uh, so I, I'd really encourage companies to get a head start. Great, great insight. Uh, I also want to touch on double materiality. It's been obviously a hotly debated topic for some time and certainly divides the EU and the US approach when it comes to regulated reporting. So Joanne, first, can you elaborate a bit more on what double materiality tries to accomplish compared to financial or single materiality? Sure. So, so essentially, double materiality is is basically where a company needs to take into consideration both financial and impact. So, financial materiality is is where the company has to report on how sustainability issues create financial risks for the company. So, it's, that's kind of the outside in perspective. Um, impact materiality is where the company um, has to look at how the company impacts people and the environment. So it's from the the inside out. So the double materiality encompasses both. Basically, it's the inside out perspective and the outside in perspective. And this this perspective is quite different um, from the SEC climate disclosure rules um, currently, um, you know, published in or proposed in the in the US as well as the um the the ISSB rules both of those are kind of financial impact only so that's that's really where the big difference um is with the um the CSRD right and Austin, you mentioned that you have done a materiality assessment already um a double materiality assessment uh can you tell us a little bit or give some advice about um what companies can do ahead of the rules going into effect to identify topics that meet the double materiality standard under CSRD? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So the PMI, we undertook our most recent sustainability materiality assessment in 2021, and we used three lenses. Um, so we looked at stakeholder interest and then the internal or inward impact and the external or outward impact. And then we reported kind of prioritized, consolidated results, but then we also uh, reported results specific to each of these lenses. So for example, the outward impact result, the inward impact result, uh, and so on. And then we also put together a list of emerging sustainability topics. Uh, maybe quite, haven't quite reached that level yet, but that we anticipate will in sort of the short to medium term. Um, and so for us, we, we think this really has helped stakeholders understand what single versus double materiality looks like for our business and for our circumstances, but then it also helps us future-proof the process a bit and kind of set ourselves up for adhering to some of these impending regulations, whether that's ISSB or, or SEC proposals or ESRS. Yes 
Um, so we're going to need to revisit this and obviously we'll need to make some necessary adjustments, but we feel the process has left us pretty well positioned to understand the topics that we think we'll need to report against. Um, and it gives us a pretty solid foundation moving forward. Um, so I, I would suggest to, to companies that, you know, maybe haven't already undertaken a, a materiality assessment, or maybe they have, but it hasn't been through this lens of double materiality, that they get started on that, even if it's an internal exercise, um, to really begin to understand, again, what is the exposure and, and what are the potential implications uh, for the company. And then I would say, you know, on the more technical side, at this point for us, where we already report against Tasmanian GRI, uh, we are fairly kind of comfortable with our ability and sort of infrastructure to collect some of this enterprise-wide data. Um, but then the next step is really exploring how to do this at sort of an EU block level um, or looking at the external assurance, uh, as I mentioned before, to really respond to the CSRD requirements in a more streamlined manner. Yeah. Great advice. Thanks, Austin. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Austin. Um, so other key concepts as well that are quite important for the CSRD is this concept that Austin mentioned there of assurance. So the CSRD introduces for the first time a, an EU-wide requirement for limited assurance um, for the sustainability information. So the idea is that there will be this requirement that um, reports be subject to limited assurance initially. And potentially then, um, depending on whether or not these assurance sustainability standards are published or not, there will be a move to reasonable assurance uh, in the longer term. So the whole idea behind this is to ensure that reported information is accurate and reliable. And it really is designed to, you know, to avoid the pitfalls that were experienced with, with the with the NFRD. Um, digitization as well is another um, important concept here. So undertaking will be required to prepare their financial statements and management record in a single electronic reporting format and digitally tag it, making it machine readable. Um, so, so that's also an important um, aspect. And then I guess the, the big aspect, which I'll touch upon in a bit more detail um, shortly, are these mandatory European sustainability reporting standards. So unlike the NF4D, where companies could choose to report um, using any uh, reporting framework, the CSRD specifically mandates reporting according to these um, European sustainability reporting standards. So these standards were proposed or published by FRAG, which is the Financial Reporting Advisory Group. They were submitted to the EU Commission in December, I believe. So they're currently with the EU Commission um, and they will be published, um, hopefully finalized in, in June of this year. Um, so these standards are, are, are really, really quite important. I'll jump in again with another question. Oh, sure. um, can can you tell us about the types of penalties imposed for non-compliance with CSRD? Sure. So um, the the directive pretty much gives member states um, a carte blanche to 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 kind of impose whatever administrative um, sanctions or penalties that are um, that are necessary if uh, if a company violates the provisions of the directive. As this is a directive, um, it, each member state has to implement the provisions of the directive. It's unlike a regulation in the EU. Regulations are directly enforceable in, in member states, but directives, on the other hand, need to be implemented. So directives typically do give member states um, a certain um, amount of leeway. The directive does state, however, that whatever sanctions and penalties are imposed by a member state, they have to be effective, proportionate and dissuasive. And they have to take into account certain uh, criteria, such as the, the gravity duration of the breach of the, the specific reporting um, requirement, um, whether the company has had any previous infringements, um, whether the company is cooperating, that sort of thing. But essentially, it, it means that you may have a situation whereby um, uh, infringement of uh, uh, the the directive in Ireland, let's say, could potentially result in stricter penalties than in France or in in Spain. So that's um, that's just something to to bear in mind that there will be slightly different, slightly differing um, infringement procedures in each of the EU member states. Right. Yeah, that definitely takes reporting to the next level. 
Yeah. Um, I will pose another question to both of you. And I know we've, we've touched on how companies can uh, prepare, but since we're wrapping up the key concepts here, if you both could maybe uh, weigh in on, um, you know, how, how companies can prepare to meet these obligations, obviously to avoid these sanctions and, and do so in an effective and efficient way. Sure. I mean, I can I can kick off maybe before Austin. Yeah. I mean, what I would say is, and I mean, Austin has touched upon this already, is is to really understand the the, the timelines. I think you know, looking at the CSRD, look at the draft um, sustainability reporting mm -hmm. standards, assess whether and when your subsidiaries or your entire consolidated group will become subject to it. Um, you know, consider you know which wave you will fall into. Um, so again, just being familiar with the directive and the draft standards. And I think also it's important to decide, particularly for those companies um, who may be um, required to submit reports for the first time, you need to really decide what, what company department will own the process. Because traditionally, you know, the finance department um, was responsible for financial reporting. But now that we're looking at non-financial reporting, um, there will be a lot of other organizations in the company involved, you know, human resources, um, you know, sustainability working groups, committees, et cetera. So it's really, I think, deciding um, who who will be involved and and also collecting the data. Again, this is something that Austin already alluded to. Um, that's going to be one of the biggest challenges, particularly for companies who have never prepared consolidated financial statements before. So it's, it's how do you obtain information from your subsidiaries in appropriate timelines and to the standards that um, will be subject to this appropriate level of assurance. So that's going to be a challenge. And then I think finally, and again, Austin also mentioned this, is um, is really looking um, whether you do it internally or whether you outsource it. Is, is keeping track and monitoring all of the regulatory developments in this area because um, regulations are coming out all of the time. So it is a real challenge for a lot of companies to keep on top of these regulations. So I would recommend um, either, you know, appointing one person or a number of people within your organization to monitor and track all of these regulations and the developments within the CSRD, tracking the member state implementations of the CSRD or outsourcing it to, um, you know, a, a professional regulatory um, tracking service like compliance and risks, for instance, um, whereby, you know, you have a lot of companies um, that, that specialize in this area. So that would be really, really important, just keeping on track of what's coming down the line. Yeah, and I think my, my initial thoughts, uh, kind of building off part of what you were saying at the beginning, but in terms of who to get involved within your organization, I, I would say really um, to get your internal audit and risk functions involved uh, to either perform sort of a gap analysis of your existing disclosures or to provide commentary on your non-financial reporting process, because oftentimes those processes are different within, even within the same company. Um, so this can really help simplify things and, and reduce cost and burden when you're thinking about engaging with external insurance providers. Um, but it can also help streamline and strengthen internal controls and other processes, you know, just more generally. Um, and then also building off what you said, it, it's also a really good idea to start putting together cross-functional working groups or teams that might include your like corporate secretary, maybe legal operations, human resources, and, and so on, um, to really start the conversation and help ensure you have adequate kind of resources and buy-in from across the organization, because there are so many more topics kind of a standard financial work, uh, report that you're really going to have to consider. Um, and then I think one other thing that stood out on your previous slide was digitization. And so I, I think similar to my comments at climate transition plans, there, there are a huge number of kind of established and emerging service providers that can help with sustainability management systems and report preparation, tagging, whether it's through XPRL in the U.S. or similar functionalities with the ESRS. Um, so it, it sounds kind of foreign. It sounds kind of scary, um, but but really, it's 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 a very common feature. <laughs> I think a lot of these reporting uh, softwares and tools. Yeah, great insight, and uh, we're definitely a recurring theme here of cross-functional collaboration, which I think a lot of sustainability reporters will be very familiar with that. And you know, maybe it's going to be. Uh, a little, a little newer to um, the financial organization, but 
um, probably something that has other benefits for companies as well. For sure. Yeah, definitely. For sure. So I'll touch a little bit here about, about the, um, or, or touch on the, um, the standards that were um, published by FRAG. And there are 12 of them in total currently before the commission. As I mentioned earlier, these are all due to be pub- uh, finalized at the end of June. Um, there were 13 to begin with, but um, when during the consultation process, FRAG decided to streamline them and they were reduced to 12. So there are two cross-cutting standards. So basically, these are standards that apply to all sustainability matters across the board. And then you have um, five environments. So you've got a series then of, of 12 topical standards, five environmental standards. So they cover climate change, pollution, water and marine, biodiversity and ecosystems and resource use. And then you have the four social standards. So covering your own workforce, workers in the value chain, affected communities, and then consumers and end users. And then you have one um, governance standard, which is a business conduct standard. So as I mentioned, um, in the earlier part of the consultation, there were in fact two governance standards, but uh, FRAG decided to merge these um, into one. Um, a couple of important things to note about these as well is they don't actually cover metrics. So they're all, they're sector agnostic. They cover strategy, targets, action plans, and resources. The actual metrics are going to be set out in sector-specific standards, um, which I mentioned here. Those sector-specific standards have not yet been published, but they are expected to be coming out um, later this year, um, along with the um, SME proportionate standards also. So again, there's there's a lot of work. FRAG is doing a lot of work in relation to these to these standards and uh, each standard then contains a certain number of disclosure requirements and um, there are 82 disclosure requirements actually in total covering all 12 standards um, this number was reduced during the uh, the original consultation process uh, there were actually 136 disclosure standards but again um, you know bearing in mind that FRAG really want to make this process as simple um, for companies as possible. They decided to consolidate and, and streamline a lot of those disclosure requirements. So we're now looking at, at a total of, of 82 um, potential disclosure requirements. And Joanne, do you expect any substantive changes to the ESRS um, draft before the commission now, or is it likely to be enacted as is or mostly as is? Yeah, I mean, I guess it's hard to tell until the final versions are actually published by the commission in June. It's really, really hard to tell. But the EU commission have stated that, you know, their purpose isn't really to change the substance of these standards. Their their main focus is is to to improve the clarity of the standards. So. I was actually on a, I attended a webinar a couple of weeks ago that was hosted by the Irish Department of Trade and Enterprise. And there was a spokesperson from the EU Commission on that webinar. And um, he confirmed that it's not really their intention to make any substantial changes. So I don't, I don't foresee anything substantive, but there may be, um, uh, yeah, some areas where they, they improve the clarity of, of certain provisions. So um, we'll just have to watch this space, I think, at the moment. So it's I just know for those focus. preparing. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, so again, because the the this call, this this webinar is focusing on cli- uh, climate transition or climate disclosure regs, I kind of just wanted to just do a little bit of a deep dive into what a climate transition plan should include. Um, that, you know, and it's interesting actually in a recent um uh, survey published by the CDP, um. Of those companies that have disclosed a transition plan, only 0.4% were regarded as actually being credible. So there's a lot of talk about climate transition plans, um, but you know there's a real, um, I think, focus on on credibility and tangible climate transition plans. So the the draft climate change standard does include some guidance and some pointers as to what a climate transition plan should include. Um, and essentially, they should they should allow or should outline what a company will deliver on in terms of their strategy to align with the you know the latest climate science recommendations. So they should include 
very clear, measurable targets on on greenhouse gas emissions and and you know net zero pledges to be achieved in a specific time frame. So the targets should be time bound. That's really really important. They should have the detail as to how to translate these commitments into action. Um, and governance mechanisms, you know, are these climate transition plans approved by the board? Are they approved by management? How are they going to be financed? How are they going to be governance, governed? And then obviously just transition. So there's a lot of um, um, discussion as well at the moment about climate transition plans that include the just transition. So by just transition, I mean, you're not looking just at greenhouse gas emissions, but you're also looking at the, the social component of transitioning towards, you know, a world that will stay within this global warming of 1.5. So companies need to ensure that this transition towards a, a neutral economy happens in, in a very, very fair way. So these are all aspects that, um, that a climate transition plan should include. So this slide is, is, it can be quite daunting when you look at it first, and it's just really it's, you know, and I'm not going to go through it in a huge amount of detail, but I just wanted to give, um, I suppose, our listeners and attendees today a flavor of, of what's going on outside of the EU. Um, because even though the EU is most definitely leading the way in this area, there's a lot of jurisdictions that are they're following suit as well. So I kind of wanted to focus on maybe two or three of these in particular. I guess um, the one that um, seems to be getting a lot of attention at the moment or the, or the two rules that are getting a lot of attention at the moment are the two US draft rules. So uh, we spoke about them or Austin mentioned them earlier, in particular, the, the climate disclosure proposed rule um, from the, the, um, the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. So this rule was published back in March. And it essentially, it would apply if it's finalized to listed companies and it would require them to include certain climate related disclosures in their um, statements and periodic reports. So this rule is due to be finalized in April 2023. So that's definitely um, one to, to keep an eye on. Um, and similarly, in November in 2022, um, the US also proposed this federal supplier climate risks and resilience rule. Again, this, this would require major um, federal contractors and also significant federal contractors to include um, certain types of information um, and including they will have to report on their scope one, two and three emissions. Um, so that's also one to watch. Um, also, the deadline for comments for that was actually the 13th of February. So that, um, you know, we should expect some movement on that rule shortly. Two other U.S. Um, proposals, actually, which I haven't referenced here, but which might also be worth mentioning um, because both of these are fairly recent um, and they come out of um, the state of California are the uh, Climate Corporate Data Accountability Bill and the Preparation of Climate Related Financial Risk Reports Bill. Both of these bills, I think, um, were proposed by by the same or uh, the same group of senators in California. But the Climate Corporate Data Accountability Senate Bill is one in particular that a lot of our customers are um, are asking about because it would apply to not just um, listed companies, but it would apply to limited liability companies with revenues in excess of $1 billion and that do business in California. So if that rule is finalized, it would require those companies to annually disclose their scope one, two, and three greenhouse gas emissions to um, an emissions registry that will be set up. So again, that's, that's certainly something to watch. Um, one of the other um, countries I wanted to focus on there also was the UK. In April of last year, they also published two rules. One um, is a climate-related financial disclosure rule, which applies to listed companies. And the other one is a climate-related financial disclosure rule that applies to limited liability partnerships. Um, both of those rules entered into force in April 2022. Um, and also, um, you know, very, very um, interesting developments in, in the UK. They have set up a task force on um, transition plans. Also, they've recently released a consultation um, to try and publish a gold standard to help guide companies on 
on the, the types of information that should be included in these transition plans. So there's a lot of information coming out of the of the UK as well. And then finally, just on this list, I wanted to touch upon the Australian consultation, which was also um, published in November as well. They um, issued a consultation on mandatory climate disclosures, um, which would be aligned with a lot of the um, the reporting developments elsewhere um, in the globe as well. So again, a lot of a lot of activity going on outside of the EU. But as I said, the EU are definitely leading leading the way here. Um, so I suppose just to kind of uh, if I just go, oh, hang on a second, my slide seem to be going backwards. Sorry, bear with me for one second here. Oh, here we go. Apologies, I'm going backwards instead of forwards. So I suppose well, one of my last slides here is um, just to kind of, I suppose, bring together the three main proposals. These are really the big three to keep an eye on at the moment. Um, the draft EU reporting standards, the ISSB proposals, and the the US um uh, Security Exchange Commission climate proposal as well that I also mentioned. So there's a lot of overlap and alignment between these three proposals, but there are also some notable differences between them as well. Um, I'm not going to go into the real nitty gritty of them. Um, it's it's quite clearly set out in the table there, but I guess one of the main differences is um, that the, the the European standards are obviously broader. So they cover the E, the S and the G, the environmental, the social and the governance. Um, whereas the ISSB proposal is very much focused on environment at the moment, um, as is the, the US SEC proposal. Um, it's also worth noting that these are all still drafts um, subject to change. Although I think, as I mentioned earlier, the European standards are probably less likely to change substantively than perhaps the, the other two. Um, all of these proposals, as you can see at the bottom of the table, they're all, um, they're all, you know, fairly well aligned with existing voluntary frameworks, particularly the, the TCFD. And I think that's really important to note because a lot of companies um, are quite concerned about, um, about these mandatory reporting standards. However, if you are already um, already reporting to um, using one of the voluntary frameworks, um, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, reporting and data collection that you're already doing that will definitely go towards, you know, your mandatory reporting obligations under one of these proposals here. So I think it is important to note that these three proposals are very much, um, you know, they draw upon and they are aligned with some of the existing voluntary reporting mechanisms um, as well. So as I said, if you're already focusing on the TCFD, for example, for your ESG reporting, you have a, a real advantage over, over companies that, that aren't doing that at the moment. Joanne, uh, since you just brought up this alignment with voluntary standards, what is EFRA doing with regard to them? You know, where do GRI and SASB, for instance, fit in? Are they still here to stay as voluntary standards? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a good question. Um, I think the um, I mean, there's a lot of a lot of like progress and ongoing discussions between EFRAG and these various voluntary bodies at the moment. And also between the the EU and these bodies as well. I mean, the aim, particularly with regards to the EU, is to try and maximise alignment and and interoperability. And the the European Commission in particular has been really really vocal about not wanting to reinvent the wheel and to avoid these multiple reporting regimes. So the the um, European Commission and EFRAG have been working with all of these standards bodies to ensure global comparability. Um, the EU Commission is also engaged with the ISSB and the GRI. Um, and uh, on a recent webinar, actually, the EU Commissioner representative noted that um, the aim is to try and develop this sort of a, um, a mapping table um, with um, all of these uh, proposals once they're finalized, of course. So this mapping table um, will basically set out the areas that each of these proposals have in common, but also the areas that they 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 differ. Um, so this will be really, really important for companies that may be um, you know, maybe subject to all of them. 
Um, it is important to note as well that the EU standards are very much largely aligned already with, as I mentioned, the TCFD, um, the ISSB and, and the GRI. And when the draft standards were submitted to the EU Commission in, in December, FRAG also released two um, additional documents. There are two appendices to the draft. One of them maps the existing TCFD recommendations um, with the European standard, I think a climate change standard. And then the other document maps the ISSB proposals with the European standards. So again, the idea is to illustrate how these European standards have integrated, you know, to the maximum extent possible, the content of both the um, the ISSB and the TCFD, because I know a lot of a lot of companies find find this this quite confusing. Understandably, and Austin, uh, obviously, you're a very mature reporting company. Will voluntary standards continue to play a role in your overall reporting approach? Um, and also, of course, thinking about regions that are less regulated uh, than the EU on the reporting front. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, I think one thing just to build off prior comments is, uh, so just for clarification, SASB is now part of the IFRS. So the SASB standards, uh, as well as integrated reporting framework, both rolled forward to the Value Reporting Foundation, and then that, that rolled into the ISSB. Um, so the ISSB will carry forward with the SASB and use those as kind of like the basis moving forward for the topic-specific standards uh, for, the, for the various uh, proposals. So if you're, if you're already responding to SASB, you're very well positioned to in turn eventually respond to, to ISSB as well. Um, but to your question, um, I think for us, it, it's still a lot to, uh, to be decided. Um, a lot of the considerations are really centering around future regulatory developments, um, as well as the fact that we are a U.S. listed company. So you know, our annual management report takes the form of annual report on our Form 10K, and that's really subject to SEC requirements. Um, very much focused on financial materiality or this inward impact with targeting the financial community, including investors um, and also regulators. So for us, a kind of a fairly narrow subset of this sort of sustainability related information can really be included in our annual report. And so like, you know, many other U.S. listed companies, we have to figure out how and where to report sustainability related information that is sort of of interest to this broader range of stakeholders, employees and civil society, NGOs, agencies, you know, among others. Um, so considering for us that, that CSRD won't really impact our consolidated group level reporting, at least on a mandatory basis until, until sort of fiscal year 28 data and fiscal year 29, safe to say voluntary reporting kind of consolidated the group level that kind of goes beyond these regulatory requirements will continue for some time. But I'd say some factors we are considering is the extent to which our voluntary integrated report will eventually align with these ISSP standards that, that uh, were mentioned, uh, assuming voluntary application and sort of non-regulated filings will be allowed for U.S. listed companies. That was kind of a, a point of contention in the initial proposals. Um, so, I mean, even if these standards are unlikely to become regulatory requirements in the U.S. because of the U.S.'s particularly kind of narrow scope uh, of information that can be included in a management report, uh, at least in the short to medium term, we, we kind of anticipate sufficient investor interest to push us to align our disclosures with the ISSP standards kind of to the extent possible um, pretty quickly, you know, pretty early on. Uh, and that, as I said, that that does cover essentially the, the SASB standards, which we already report again, uh, against voluntarily. So there, there will be some level of overlap, some level of decision making around how to target them. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. Um, we have about a minute left, so I'll just quickly say that uh, we do have some great questions in Q&A and we will get those answers to you. Um, and uh, Joanne, I'll let you wrap up the presentation. Sure. So I guess um, just to wrap up, you know, what's in store for the rest of the year? Again, keeping an eye on those three key draft proposals, the European Standards, the ISSB and the SEC. The exposure drafts for the sector-specific um, ESRS standards, um, they're definitely going to be released this year. Um, and those um, sectors in scope will typically include, I think, textiles, jewellery, 
um, some of the energy um, sector as well. So definitely something to keep an eye on. Um, the exposure draft for the unlisted SMEs also want to keep an eye on. And again, the modified set of disclosure standards for non-EU groups in scope of the CSRD. Um, the ISSB also recently announced um, that it will be potentially pulling together a draft disclosure standard on natural ecosystems in the just transition. So that's something to, to keep an eye on. And then obviously greenwashing and climate change litigation risks. There's been such a huge increase um, in this space um, that that is something to definitely be aware of. Um, as we move forward um, into 20 or into the rest of the year. Climate transition plans, I've touched upon those already. Um, the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive and all of the requirements that that will contain once that is finalized, um, including the human rights and environmental due diligence requirements, definitely a big one to watch in the EU. And then finally, I guess the increased alignment and cooperation between the standards bodies as we've discussed as well. So there's a lot in scope. I mean, there's going to be a lot more regulation in this space as well, I think, in 2023. So my advice really for companies is, you know, to, to stay, um, you know, stay on, on top of the regulations that are coming out um, to make sure that you're monitoring and tracking all of these regulatory developments, you know, particularly the ones that are coming down the line. So keep on top of the proposals. Um, because there's a lot more happening in this space and there'll be a lot more later this year as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Joanne and Austin, for sharing your time and insights and, and providing such useful information to our particip participants. Um, and thank you to our participants for spending a good hour with us today to learn about this important and complex topic. And I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thanks Great. A lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.